going to start just very quickly with something that was in the news today, and that is the FDA approving for over-the-counter use Narcan, uh, the drug overdose reversal medication. Is this a case of the FDA getting ahead of the game or playing catch-up to what has already been sort of green-lighted by many states? Well, Tyler, the FDA has to go through a process. They've got to evaluate safety and efficacy, and they've got to ensure that this drug is safe over the counter. It's very encouraging that they made that determination. Uh, this is great for patient access. This is going to bring Narcan uh, really to everybody uh, and, and make it widely accessible. And ultimately, uh, this is going to save lives. When we go back and we look at the last three years and the development of the uh, COVID vaccines and the speed with which the FDA uh, moved those and those uh, treatments forward, do you believe the FDA is becoming a quicker place to get drug approvals? In other words, that the, that the speed is picking up at no sacrifice of safety and efficacy. The FDA professional staff are committed to preserving um, all of their processes, and so I don't think at any time the agency is going to short-circuit short their processes. Uh, the agency's learned a lot of lessons as a result of COVID. They're able to move much more nimble, be much more agile, uh, and, and this is a great thing, especially as we are now in the post-COVID world, bringing new cures to market and being able to do so more quickly. You have been known throughout your career as a, as a person who has focused uh, or evangelized uh, on, on behalf of greater competition in, in the marketplace for health care, for pharmaceuticals, and so forth. But it does seem, from a casual observer like me, that maybe there is, with so much consolidation having taken place, that there is less competition, not more. Big drug companies go out and get bigger big hospital systems go out and buy practices uh, and buy other hospitals and get bigger. Uh, insurers get bigger and bigger. Tell me about the state of competition in the medical and healthcare delivery marketplace and whether it's working or not. Tyler, this is all the more reason, as you mentioned, we are seeing consolidation both in the life sciences and also on the payer delivery services side. This is all the more reason that we need to have smarter deregulation uh, seen both at the federal uh, level and also at the states. Um, that's the only way that we're going to keep competition alive and well, um, ensuring that we see an infusion of new capital coming to market um, and being able to bring both new cures to market and also novel ways of delivering those cures to patients. Is it working? It is working. Uh, it's a slow process. Washington does not move quickly, uh, as we all know, but um, as we continue to see activity in the market, we saw today uh, news of uh, CVS closing the deal with Signify. We're going to have to continue to come up with new uh, methods of regulating these industries and thinking about how we can also deregulate to increase new entrants coming into the market. There is a lot of talk these days uh, about something called value-based care. Forgive me for not knowing what exactly that means. Explain it. Tell me what it is. Tell me whether it is a good thing. And if it is, how do we get there? So, Tyler, at its very fundamental level, value-based care is paying for quality and clinical outcomes. This is a big change from how we typically pay for health care, which is fee-for-service medicine. In other words, the more you do, the more you make, the more you pay. And so the pendulum has now swung. Over 50% of Medicare beneficiaries are enrolled in Medicare Advantage, which is a form of value-based uh, care. Um, and we're going to continue to see that pendulum swinging. Um, it's the only way that we're going to see um, entities like Medicare, like commercial insurers, remain solvent. Uh, it's that move to value-based care and paying for outcomes and quality and holding all the stakeholders in the value chain accountable, everyone from the payers to providers and also patients. You ha you're one of the rare uh, uh, birds who has worked both at uh, CMS, uh, Medicare, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, 
and the FDA in high positions. Uh, Medicare very much in the news, its viability, its sustainability. Uh, there was a very famous magazine cover years ago called Can This Marriage Be Saved? I want to spin it forward uh, 50, 60 years. Can Medicare be saved, put on a sustainable fiscal uh, trajectory, and if so, how? Tyler, it can be saved. At the current rate, Medicare is going to go bankrupt in about five years. Uh, that's uh, a number of entities have looked at Medicare. It's going to go insolvent unless we have a paradigm shift. And going back to your earlier point around value-based care, that's how we're going to save Medicare. We're going to have to shift providers into providing accountable care for their patients. They're gonna be held accountable for high quality care and clinical outcomes. And that's the only way that we're gonna be able to keep Medicare solvent. Do taxes have to go up to keep Medicare solvent? Medicare not, taxes? Not necessarily. Uh, I, I don't think taxes really come into this if we're shifting towards value-based care. And if we're holding providers accountable, that in itself is going to generate savings for the trust fund. We have to run Medicare like any other enterprise, almost like a P&L statement. Let's talk, let's switch gears a little bit. I want to skip around. We don't have all that much time. And talk about some of the treatments that have been approved for uh, uh, conditions such as Alzheimer's and ALS, among others. They are expensive. Is there a disconnect between FDA approval of those medications and insurers' willingness to pay for them? And if so, how do you bridge that gap? Tyler, having been on both sides of this um, and at both agencies as a regulator and also at a payer, there's a massive disconnect. Um, it's what I refer to as the valley of death. In other words, the gap that exists between an FDA marketing authorization and ultimately being able to get those novel cures to patients at the bedside. At the government level, it's a result of a bureaucracy and it's an, it is a result of two agencies to the point of Medicare that are not communicating clearly around the standards at which companies are being held to. So there's a traffic jam. We're seeing new therapies, as you mentioned, Alzheimer's, novel cell and gene therapies coming to market, being evaluated for safety and effectiveness, and then many of them are not able to ultimately get to the patient. They're either issues with coverage, coding, and payment, and any one of those can result in a new cure or a new treatment not getting to the patient. Let me conclude with a quick question that, that I don't know whether it goes to the heart of something that, that is a top of mind for you. What is the role of uh, private enterprise companies like Clayton Dubillier and Rice uh, in the medical uh, discovery pipeline, in the delivery pipeline? What is the role for private enterprise here? And is what, and, and on the other side, what is the role for the public payer to play here? Where, where do the, how do the, can the two work better together? So both are critical. You can't have one without the other. On the private capital side, I would say beyond just capital, uh, private capital, private equity, venture capital, uh, provide expertise, subject matter expertise, operational expertise to fledgling ideas, entrepreneurs, and it's a great union that can ultimately propel great ideas forward. On the public side, you have to have the right regulatory and financial incentives to get new cures and new ways of delivering care to market, and you have to have both working together. 